Breaking tonight, U.S. federal agents may have been looking for documents related to nuclear weapons when they searched Donald Trump's home. The latest on that search and the backlash. The allegations are very troubling. A CBC News investigation, more than 30 students with harrowing accounts, what some of them want to see. You have the power to actually do something to step in and protect people. Being troubled isn't enough. Should Canadians be paid to donate blood plasma? Only countries that compensate plasma donors are self-sufficient. A controversial solution to a plasma shortage. This is The National. Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. We begin in the United States where there are new details tonight about Monday's FBI raid on Donald Trump's estate in Florida. U.S. media is reporting agents may have been looking for documents related to nuclear weapons. So let's get right to Katie Simpson in Washington. Katie, it sounds very alarming, but can you take us through the details tonight? Now, this is according to the Washington Post. FBI agents searched former President Donald Trump's Florida home for classified documents relating to nuclear weapons. The Post is citing people familiar with the investigation, and agents were reportedly looking for other documents as well, but there are no specifics being reported on that just yet. It remains unclear if the documents reported by the Post were actually seized during that search. Attorney General Merrick Garland would not offer any clarity when he spoke for the first time since Monday's search. He announced that the Department of Justice is seeking to unseal the search warrant in this case since Donald Trump already confirmed it happened and given the intense public interest. I personally approved the decision to seek a search warrant in this matter. The department does not take such a decision lightly. Donald Trump has to decide by Friday afternoon whether he's going to fight that order, and it could take some time, a few days, before the public actually gets to see what is in that document, if it happens. Now, in the wake of what's happened this week, there has been a surge in violent rhetoric online, threats directed at the Department of Justice, the Attorney General, and members of the FBI. In Ohio, investigators are looking for possible links between an attack on an FBI field office in Cincinnati that ended in a deadly shootout with police. The suspect was heavily armed, according to authorities, and actually tried to shoot his way into the office with a nail gun. He fled and was surrounded by officers in a cornfield. According to police, he shot at officers. They returned fire, and the suspect is now dead. Multiple news agencies are reporting the suspect in that case was at the Capitol on January 6th and that his social media accounts show him repeating the lie the election was stolen and engaging with some of Trump's most outspoken supporters, conspiracy theorist and representative Marjorie Taylor Greene, for example. This is going to be an incident that is discussed and examined for some time for some time to see if what the direct links could be and whether there is an impact from the lie the 2020 election was stolen. Adrian. All right, so much there. Katie Simpson in Washington. Thank you, Katie. Thanks. Now here in Canada, there is a development about a private Christian school in Saskatoon and the allegations of physical, sexual and emotional abuse spanning decades inside its doors. So we first told you about the Legacy Christian Academy earlier this month and how some former students were fighting back, sharing their stories publicly for the first time with CBC News. So since then, more students have come forward with similar allegations and a class action lawsuit has been filed. And now, following our investigation, the province has intervened, appointing an administrator to increase oversight. But as Bonnie Allen explains, that response falls short of what students have been calling for. The allegations are very troubling. Saskatchewan's Education Minister Dustin Duncan speaking for the first time about allegations of abuse at a private Christian school in Saskatoon and the calls to shut it down. I'm not prepared to take that step to close the school. Um, Whether it's an independent school or a public school, we hold individuals accountable for actions. Uh, and so we don't close schools. The province provides funding to the church-run Legacy Christian Academy, formerly known as Christian Centre Academy. Over the past nine days, a CBC News investigation has reported on at least 30 former students who allege abuse spanning decades. Students describe violent discipline, 
solitary confinement, sexual abuse and horrific rituals. A former youth pastor at the school confirmed to CBC he helped perform an exorcism on a student to banish, quote, gay demons. A criminal investigation is underway, and this week students filed a $25 million class action lawsuit. It names nearly two dozen school and church officials. This church and school exhibits all the hallmarks of what we often think of as a cult. These private schools have been subject to government regulations since 2012. There are some gaps uh, that, that uh, we've been able to identify. Now the province is appointing an independent administrator to oversee Legacy Christian Academy and two other schools that have staff members connected to these allegations. There will be additional surprise inspections. We're very concerned for the children who attend that school, um, and that school is going to start up in a few weeks. Stephanie Hutchinson and her siblings, Christina and Nick, have all filed criminal complaints about their time at the school in the 1990s and early 2000s. When you're the Minister of Education and you have the power to actually do something to step in and protect people, being troubled isn't enough. I would like to see the place closed personally and that um, the people who um, are in charge are not able to, um, to have anything to do with education ever again. Going forward, independent schools will also have to report any criminal investigations to the Education Ministry. Until now, they haven't had to tell anyone. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Meadow Lake, Saskatchewan. We are keeping an eye on some dramatic video from Southern California tonight of a so-called fire NATO. Now, high temperatures and dry air mixed with fire to create this tower of flames. Over 200 firefighters battled the brush fire. There are no reports of injuries or structural damage. But the story of fire and heat goes on. This is France, where crews are battling a raging wildfire in the country's wine region near Bordeaux. 10,000 people have been forced from their homes and several properties were destroyed. More than 1,000 firefighters are still trying to contain it, but the hot, dry conditions make it very difficult. This is part of a series of fires across Europe this summer as heat waves bake the whole continent. So the heat doesn't care much for borders. So across the channel from France and the UK, people are sweltering. A four-day extreme heat warning is in effect, but staying inside doesn't help because most homes don't have air conditioning. Katie Nicholson shows us the race to keep cool in a country not ready for this. Call them hot weather heroes. A small team bringing cool air to a stifling British flat. Very hot, very hot, um, particularly in this room. Just as another extreme heat warning settles in like an unwelcome guest. In parks, a strong whiff of hay permeates the air from the sun-bleached grass. Streams evaporate it. And in a scene more common in North America, police smash the window of a locked car to free a dog inside just in time. Living in the UK, we're not aware of, of how hot it actually can get, and we're not prepared for that. This AC installation, a rare attempt to get ready. It's estimated fewer than 5% of homes in the UK have AC. Just a walk down this street shows no units jutting out of homes. But as the temperatures increase, so does the demand. For the past month, I've been doing overtime like crazy, so we have been busy, which is good. It's making so hot, like in Europe. Like, we feel like we are not in England, we are in Europe. Eight years ago, Raw Brushmany would install one unit a day. That's changed. Actually, on the summer, we do three, four, how much we can. Ready? Yeah. But with every new AC installation, the demand for energy goes up. They, it will have an impact because we still use a lot of fossil fuels. That, that impact is quite, uh, quite significant. The cost of air conditioning will likely keep it out of reach for most. And Britons will just have to suffer through without. After all, for centuries, heat was not the enemy, says this professor of energy and environment. We have 70 times the number of people dying from the cold than we do dying from the heat. Uh, but the consequence of this is we just haven't really designed our buildings to cope with overheating. 
This is the first year the UK introduced regulations to build homes that don't overheat. A little late for this heat wave. And so, it's the outdoors. The shade and the sea for the majority without AC. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, London. As these heat waves become more common, there's a push to get the word out about how dangerous they can be. So as Jayla Bernstein shows us, one idea being tested, name the heat waves the way we do hurricanes. I cannot deal with it. This is just too much. Around the world, it's been a deadly hot summer. This Madrid man says the heat is unbearable. He's worried it'll get worse. To help people be better prepared, a new international project is experimenting with naming heat waves. These heat waves aren't going away, and so we're trying to do something innovative and different. Last month, heat wave Zoe saw temperatures climb above 43 degrees Celsius in Seville, Spain. Heat is an invisible challenge for most people. The project is getting mixed reviews. I think there's a lot that Canada will be able to learn from the experience of California or, you know, Seville and Athens, other places that are going ahead with these ranking and naming uh, pilot projects. She says raising awareness about a heat wave won't ensure people actually have a cool place to go, but she's intrigued. Others are more quick to dismiss the initiative. I don't really see any benefit or advantage to it. Um, and if we were going to do it, I would favor not a city doing it, not even a National Meteorological Service. I would say that the World Meteorological Organization, which is in charge with uh, naming uh, tropical storms, um, let them weigh in on it. That UN agency did weigh in. A lot of our experts, I have to be quite honest, are still not convinced that this is doable. He says what works for a hurricane doesn't necessarily work for heat and warns of confusion if cities don't agree on names. If we get into this issue of naming and then if there's a different name, if it's, it's Tom in Montreal and Alice in, in, in Toronto and people are traveling, it's, it's, we think that the communication there would be a detriment to civil protection. Those behind the pilot project say they're aware of concerns, but will wait until the end of the summer to evaluate the impact of their project. Jayla Bernstein, CBC News, Montreal. Beyond sharing the misery of heat currently, countries around the world share another real anxiety right now, the need for blood donors and especially plasma donors. Plasma requires a specific donation process and it's used to make life-saving drugs. Demand is rising, so how is a country like Canada going to meet that demand? Rene Filipponi takes us through a controversial solution. You're Ryan? I am. This is your first time donating plasma? It, it may be in you to give, but plasma donations in Canada fall far below the need. That's why Canadian Blood Services is considering partnering with private firms that pay for donations. Fundamentally, this is problematic because Canadian Blood Services hasn't been transparent. This critic says getting big corporations involved is the wrong way to go. There is no reason to undermine our voluntary uh, voluntary donor base and securing our own plasma supply through our national blood operator in order to sell it off to private industry. Okay. Canada only collects 15% of the plasma it needs. It's a component of blood donated separately that is used to make life-saving drugs. After your donation, you'll be compensated for your time. The rest comes from the U.S., where donors can make more than $800 a month for regular visits. We have no example, not anywhere in the world, not one jurisdiction that manages to collect enough plasma to meet the need of their patient communities unless they compensate donors. In a statement, Canadian Blood Services says we are working to reduce Canada's dependency on the global market, but will ensure plasma donated in Canada stays in Canada. And get paid for your contribution. A number of provinces already have private compensation for plasma donations, including Alberta, Saskatchewan and New Brunswick, where people can make up to $65 a visit. Some of that plasma is then sold abroad. Payment is banned in BC, Ontario and Quebec. The idea of that changing is a turnoff to some regular donors. It goes against the whole um, idea of, of donation, of, you know, being, doing a good deed, in effect. Canadian Blood Services is opening up new plasma donation centres across the country, but say it's not enough. 
any new paid plasma operation will need authorization by Health Canada. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Vancouver. Recently, we've been hearing about polio appearing in wastewater around the world. That, too, is a concern here. So Canada will start testing wastewater for polio in some high-risk areas. In a statement to CBC News, the Public Health Agency of Canada says PHAC has been communicating with national and international partners who are experts in this field to finalize a wastewater testing strategy. This move comes after a polio case led to paralysis in New York State. Experts are blaming vaccine hesitancy and a disruption in vaccination schedules because of the pandemic. There's a prospect of some good news here. A major trial is underway for a potential vaccine against Lyme disease. If it's approved, it would be the first vaccine of its kind in 20 years. And as Lauren Pelly shows us, it comes as cases are on the rise here. On a relaxing morning hike with her family in Toronto's Rouge Park, McCare Douglas keeps an eye out for tiny, potentially dangerous pests. We check the kids. We've definitely had a few ticks on us here or there. Um, we have some family members that have had Lyme disease, so definitely something we think about. But there's welcome news for anyone who loves the great outdoors. A new vaccine for Lyme is in the works. That's a great thing. Um, science is great. The shot is being developed by Pfizer and a French biotech company. Researchers are now seeking thousands of volunteers in the U.S. and Europe to test it out. We have patients who've already started to come in and uh, want to participate. A vaccine for dogs has long been available, but the last one for humans was pulled from the market after low demand. The latest trials are happening as reported cases of Lyme in Canada keep ticking up. Last year, there were nearly 3,000 known infections. There's just no question that people who were not encountering ticks are now encountering ticks in their own backyard. In Alberta, Janet Sperling researches the different types of bacteria ticks can carry. Lyme infections are known for early symptoms like fever and fatigue, but if left untreated, the bacteria can spread into the nervous system. So this is one of the big ticks. Sperling says ticks known for carrying Lyme are spreading north. Kingston and um, Toronto, Quebec has a very big problem. And then Nova Scotia has had a very big problem for a very long time. The health problems Canadians face from tick bites could be tough to prevent unless a new vaccine arrives, a process which could take years. Lauren Pelly, CBC News, Toronto. We are keeping an eye on a class action settlement that could change the way Canadian companies use volunteers. Work is work, and the legal system is clearly catching up. Coming up, the young volunteer who sued to get paid and set a precedent. Everything's pitch black down there. Plus an unusual blackout in Toronto's downtown core and a barge that could be to blame. And a golden tribute to a Canadian legend. It is my hope that they will remember Oscar or that it will inspire people to learn about who he was for years to come. We're back in two. We're currently working there right now, but I can't get in because like everything's pitch black down there. Well, he was not alone today. Thousand in, thousands in Toronto's downtown core we're left scrambling after a major power outage this afternoon. This evening, the city and province's hydro crews say all service has been restored. Reports are being investigated that the outage was caused by a barge carrying a crane that came into contact with a high voltage line. There are new details tonight about that blockade in Ottawa earlier this year and the decision to invoke the Emergencies Act to end those protests. Now, the details come from documents that emerged in a case brought by the Canadian Civil Liberties Association. Joining us with more on this, it's a bit complicated, is the CBC's Stephen Hoff. So Stephen, can you walk us through what we've learned? 
Yeah, Adrian, these are heavily redacted documents, but they provide a glimpse behind the government's decision-making process last February when they invoked the Emergencies Act to deal with the occupation of Ottawa. There are notes from the meetings of the Instant Response Group in February. This group included dozens of ministers, public officials, and law enforcement representatives who were being briefed on what was happening at blockades across the country. Now, one of the things that is revealing is that on February 13th, a day before invoking the act, a national security advisor says there is, quote, potential for a breakthrough in Ottawa. Tonight, the government says in a statement, the potential for a breakthrough referred to negotiations led principally by the city of Ottawa with illegal blockaders in the days before the invocation of the Emergencies Act. The government closely monitored the status of negotiations, which were disavowed by many associated with the Freedom Convoy and were ultimately unsuccessful. And the government considered this as a factor in the decision to invoke the Emergencies Act. However, both both the NDP and Conservatives are questioning the need for invoking the act when a breakthrough was possible. And is there anything that these documents reveal uh, about what the rest of the world was saying about the blockades? That there is, and it comes from the Prime Minister of himself, confirming that he says that during the talks with international partners, they all expressed concerns about Canada and the government's ability to handle blockades. The rest of that section is redacted, and Adrian, as much of these documents answer some questions, they raise many more on the actions taken by the government during those weeks in February. All right, Stephen Hoff in Ottawa. Thanks, Stephen. As we all face a changing planet, are major cities largely to blame? These buildings are among the, among the worst emitters. Coming up, we look back at the solutions to an urban problem next. Now, it may seem far off now, but soon we'll all need our winter jackets again. And don't be mad at me, you know this is true. But how about winter jackets on buildings? That's just one innovative way cities are trying to slow climate change. Tonight, we revisit Andrew's conversation with three prominent Canadians. They share their ideas and their fears for our changing planet. Lit in British Columbia last year, burnt down in minutes. There were biblical level floods in Jakarta, Indonesia massive floods. Everybody I know was shocked seeing tenants in New York dying in their apartments because they couldn't get out fast enough because the flooding was so massive. And cities aren't built to withstand these forces of nature. People know this, they see it happening, and they know there's something wrong. My name is David Miller. I'm the Managing Director of International Diplomacy for an organization called the C40 Cities Climate Leadership Group. You left out a pretty important piece of your bio, mayor of an important city. I was mayor of Toronto from 2003 to 2010 and very proud to have been so. When we think of cities, I mean, it's very easy to think of ways in which cities are affected by, by climate change. We don't as often think about in what ways cities are contributing in a pretty outsized way to climate change. About 70% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions uh, can be attributed to the activities that go on in cities, which shouldn't be a surprise when you think about it, because most people are there and most of the economy is there, but we usually don't see things that way. Is it fair to say that, that cities are also, I guess, more pragmatic? in nature that they, that, that's sort of by, by necessity, right? They, they've actually got to get things done. As a mayor, if you commit to addressing something, people expect you to, to start working on it and they expect to see change. Some cities have a lot of powers to address climate change. They address transportation, for example. They always manage waste and they sometimes manage electricity. But I don't think it's intuitive for people to look at buildings and say that is, is a huge source of carbon pollution, but it is. In New York, it's around 70%. Toronto, it's somewhere over 40%. But building net zero carbon buildings and making existing buildings extremely energy efficient. And we're seeing cities around the world do both. These buildings are everywhere and we're kind of a forgotten resource. They can be leveraged to really bring out the best of our cities and the best of our communities. 
My name is Graham Stewart. I'm a principal with ERA Architects and the director of the Tower Renewal Partnership. And that, that's a term, by the way, that didn't just come out of thin it, air. It's true. It's a term that uh, uh, I may have had a part in coining. Uh, how do we give these buildings a second life, make them climate resilient, make them ready for the 21st century? So that's really the idea around Tower Renewal. So this is the Ken Sobel Tower. And when this was built in 1967, it was a big centennial project. It was a big, uh, you know, building the future. The Jetsons have arrived in Canada. We can build, you know, spaceships and high-rise buildings. These buildings are among the, among the worst emitters. And the reason for that is they're heated by natural gas. Um, and typically they have no insulation or very little insulation. And the ones that haven't been upgraded uh, have single glazed windows made of aluminum, you know, from the 1960s. Uh, on a cold February day, you're really heating outer space and you're just constantly running the boilers to, to heat it. How do we heat this building more efficiently? And the way to do that really is to put a winter coat on the building. Come, come over here because you had a really great analogy how it's like you've put a big old winter, winter coat. coat. Totally on the building because this is really thick. So we put four inches on the inside, six inches on the outside. The original brick is in the middle and that sandwich is this super winter coat. And we put really efficient windows, so triple glazed windows. What that means is it just takes considerably less energy to heat the building. When you heat it, the heat stays inside. And astoundingly, we were able to cut the carbon produced in this building by 94%. So it uses 94% less carbon to heat and cool this building than it did when we started. You know, in the context of, of a climate crisis, storms that come more and more often, power outages that exactly. happen more and more often, is this building more resilient in that sense too? Absolutely. So when we designed this building, we actually used 2050 climate data. We said we want this building to be able to uh, withstand the projected shocks of, of a different climate, you know, the one that we, we may have 30 years from now. The modeling shows that after the interior temperature gets below 10 degrees Celsius, you know, by law, you have to evacuate that building. Right. Um, and that would happen in a typical building within four or five hours. Uh, in this building, the way that it's designed, it could last four days. Livable heat inside the building for four days after the power has gone out. Correct. Just by virtue of how insulated and, and coated. Absolutely, and, and the thing about that is that all of our buildings can be like this. I think what we saw in Katrina was the meeting of two catastrophes. We have the catastrophe of racial injustice, and then you have this crisis, another catastrophe. And what we ended up seeing, African Americans further marginalized and being completely let down by institutions that were supposed to protect them. My name is Imara Jani Rolston. I'm an associate professor at the Dallas School of Public Health at the University of Toronto, and I'm currently leading the Community Climate Resilience Lab. Climate change is inherently unfair. It is, yeah in the sense that not everyone is equally affected yeah. by it. Th that rings true? A hundred percent. Already there is a growing racial spatial income divide in our city. And so when you think about climate change layer on top of those historical injustices and inequities, then what you see is you see racialized indigenous and black folks in different parts of the city being impacted first and the worst by climate change. Different parts of the city are going to heat up in very different ways. And so what you get is something in most cities called heat island effect. And heat island effect creates increased heat in different parts of the city that have less green space, less green coverage. All the concrete, right? Uh, and so if you're someone living in a neighborhood improvement area with very little green space, and you're living in a unit that doesn't have adequate um, air conditioning, mm. then what you're doing is essentially heating up and living in this disproportionate level of heat. And what that means is that it's having a huge impact on your health overall. It has effects on our kidneys, it has effects on our lungs, and it has long-term health effects. So, uh, you know, a situation in which your neighborhood floods and your electric grid shuts down, and the food that you had in that fridge was what you had. There's no way to rebuy that food. And so you're already a family living with a great degree of precariousness. The only real solution is to do the stuff that we have intentionally turned away from, right. um, forcefully neglected, which is building more just cities. It is, in many ways, from a, I think, from a climate resilient stand, standpoint, the answer. What's behind the inertia? What do you think is truly stopping the cities of the world and the countries of the world from implementing what 
we already know works. So why aren't these great ideas, let's say Shenzhen, China, which has entirely electrified its bus fleet and its taxi fleet, why haven't they spread across North America? There's a cost to the change. Solving the climate challenge involves investment. But on the other hand, climate change isn't free. You know, billions and billions and billions of dollars of damages just in Canada alone. You know, if we take the best ideas that are happening on the ground somewhere and have worked and have made cities better places to live, which is, I think, why uh, cities are the answer to climate crisis and why we can solve it in the major cities because of what can be done now. And now is the time that matters. Now, David Miller also told Andrew that a lot of best practices to mitigate climate change already exist. They simply need, need to be replicated at scale. And he says doing that is really just a matter of choice. Now, stick around because coming up next, some new evidence connected to the war in Ukraine suggesting Russia has suffered a major loss. We will show you the before and after and what both sides claim happened. You are looking at newly released satellite images of a Russian military airbase in Crimea where eight planes were destroyed earlier this week. Now compare those images to what the view looked like in May and the damage is pretty clear. Still, Russia has denied its aircrafts were damaged and says the explosions were accidental. Now Ukraine hasn't publicly claimed responsibility, but the precision of the strike could suggest a shift in the country's military capabilities. Now, Russia's denial of reality during this war is not new. In fact, over the past six months, Vladimir Putin's propaganda machine has frankly gone into overdrive. Tonight, we revisit how Russia's compliant TV news programs are pushing those lies. Terence McKenna shows us the impact on Russians tuning in. Vladimir Putin has closed down almost all the independent TV outlets in Russia, stifling any dissenting voices. Instead, Russians can watch a niche channel called Star TV that is owned and operated by the Russian military, which provides elaborate coverage of Putin's visits to military bases to witness displays of Russia's overwhelming firepower all accompanied by the breathless commentary of military correspondents. All this is designed to show that Putin has rebuilt the military back to superpower status, that the Russian state can impose its will as required. At the same time, Putin started laying the groundwork for his present Ukraine offensive with a softer approach to propaganda. It began last July with an astonishing 5,000-word personal essay in Russian newspapers that reviewed a thousand years of Russian history, from the time of St. Vladimir, founder of the Russian Orthodox Church. The modern Vladimir strongly argued that all Russian speakers were part of one great nation, suggesting that Ukraine was not a real country, and even that the Ukrainian language was not a real language. Konstantin Egert, a Russian journalist living in Lithuania, was taken aback by the Putin article. And what we saw happening in the last months actually only proves that Putin with his Ukraine article uh, was not joking. He was not just musing about old history. It was his warning to Ukraine and to the world. Now comes the angry Putin speech Monday that put a similar message in a much more threatening manner. American Anne Applebaum has written numerous books about Russia and Ukraine. Putin's speech was an ahistorical rant, a kind of very strange and very convoluted version of Ukrainian and Russian history, which was designed to demonstrate to a Russian audience uh, that Ukraine doesn't exist, that it's not a country, it's not a real country, and it can be eradicated. One of the recurring themes from Vladimir Putin, constantly repeated on Russian TV, is that the present Ukrainian government, despite being led by a Jewish president, Volodymyr Zelensky, is somehow a pro-Nazi regime. What he wants to say is that the Ukrainian people, they are good people. In fact, they are Russians like us. 
And they need to be liberated from this horrific regime which is run by the proto-Nazis in cahoots with the West. That Nazis theme is picked up on popular Russian programs like this one on the most popular channel, where host Vladimir Zolovyov treats his Ukrainian guests with undisguised hostility. Most Russians believe that the West and Ukraine are to blame for the current crisis, probably up to 60%. And that is, this is a result of a constant stream of propaganda programs over the last eight years on Russian television. Mr. Putin picked up another of his favorite themes in his recent press conference with the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, that the Ukrainian government is exterminating Russian speakers in Eastern Ukraine. Well, Putin is using one of his traditional devices. He tells a blatant lie to the face of a Western leader, knowing that this is a lie, and knowing that the leader knows that this is a lie. And then he tells whoever it is, Schultz or Biden or Boris Johnson, disclaim it, explain why it's not so. Once again, the Putin genocide theme is given a loud echo from his acolytes on Russian TV. Certainly the intention of the repeated propaganda on television is to justify the war. It's to justify the casualties that may result from the war. It's to make Russians feel that they are fighting a mortal enemy rather than a, a, a neighboring country that has not attacked them. Occasionally, the propaganda masters demand a Russian invasion of Ukraine and extermination to follow. Many Putin analysts believe he is determined to turn Ukraine into a failed state because if democracy proved a success there, it would lead to pressure for real democracy in Russia and his removal from power. If it becomes a prosperous democracy and member of the Western club, member of the EU and NATO, uh, then it will give a lie to the Kremlin propaganda. Could that be Putin's main motivation this week? His fear of a popular uprising in Russia to match the one that happened in Ukraine exactly eight years ago. Terence McKenna, CBC News, Toronto. Next on The National, we remember a little boy who brought big energy to hockey. How did you think Zach Hyman played today? Good. I think he played really good. Thanks, Ben. We'll show you how the players are paying tribute to their super fan. Next. An Ontario court has approved a settlement to a class action lawsuit against student travel group S-Trip. Now, former TRIP leaders argued they were working as employees despite being classified as volunteers. Those labour practices were first detailed in a CBC News investigation into the group. Now this case is setting a new precedent. Farah Morali explains. It's a really great feeling. Deandra Montague's reaction to the end of a more than four-year journey the settlement of a class action lawsuit she spearheaded. In 2018, she spoke out about an S-trip student trip she led in Cuba. She said she worked 14-hour days supervising students for a week, but only received an honorarium of $150 because she says she was classified as a volunteer. She became the lead plaintiff of a class action against parent company I Love Travel. The settlement details now listed here the company has agreed to a $450,000 payout to TRIP leaders. But that's not all. It's also committing to reclassify staff as employees for future trips. I was very relieved, very happy, still am. <laughs> it, it feels like um, knowing just, just knowing that something can be changed 
that is going to impact others. She was a young worker. She was just starting her career off, just finishing school when, when this class action was launched in 2018. Uh, and to come forward in those circumstances uh, and to achieve what she was able to achieve, uh, we're just tremendously proud of, of uh, what's happened here. In the settlement, the judge described the case as novel and the result somewhat groundbreaking, adding this is the first volunteer misclassification class action in Canada and will have a significant impact on employment law. I think it sends a message to, to workers and also to employers um, that, uh, that there are recourse for, uh, for these sorts of things. A decision like this is a breath of fresh air. Employment lawyer Sunira Chaudhary says it's not often you see cases involving young people and volunteers. This might be the future of where employment law is going in some respects because employment is beginning to look a lot different these days. Whether you are an intern, whether you're a gig worker, work is work. And the legal system is clearly catching up with how to provide remedies to workers who may not be in traditional employment relationships. As for Montague, she hopes the settlement will encourage others to do what she did, speak out. I like inspired myself in a sense and hope in ways I've inspired others. Farah Morali, CBC News, Toronto. The Edmonton Oilers are mourning tonight the death of a super fan. A very special Scotia skater join us. Ben Stelter was the sort of kid who made a big impact, certainly did for the Edmonton Oilers, both on and off the ice. How do you think Zach Hyman played today? Good. Before a big game, he was always there to cheer them on. Go, yes, go. Never losing sight of that passion, even at Disneyland. Little mama, baby. He was a fan who ultimately had legions of his own. Everyone here in Calgary is cheering you on, and, and we're all big fans of you. Just such a, an amazing kid. Um, so strong, so brave. On Twitter, his dad described him as the best son he could ever hope for and the best bud ever. Ben Stelter had an aggressive type of brain cancer, and he died on Tuesday. Just a little boy. He was six years old. And another tribute to a jazz great. We're so proud. This is a privilege. An Oscar Peterson commemorative coin is going into circulation. The unveiling is in our moment. Next. Listen to that for a long time. Legendary Canadian jazz pianist and composer Oscar Peterson achieved many great things, but there's something else to add to that list. Peterson is now the first black Canadian and first performing artist on a circulation coin, making the value of Oscar's legacy priceless. And tonight, it's our moment. Throughout his life, Oscar received many awards and honors. Each one of them was very special to him, and he cherished them all. To add this commemorative circulation coin in Oscar's honor to the collection of awards and honors is something that neither Oscar nor I would ever have dreamed of. My hope that they will remember Oscar or that it will inspire people to learn about who he was for years to come. What makes me treat you the way that I do? Gee, baby, ain't I good to you? The last time I stood on this stage, it was almost 15 years ago, and it was to say a very public and painful goodbye to our dad. The fact that anybody can hold this brand new piece of Canadian history in their hand and have the opportunity, opportunity to learn about someone they may never have heard of, they may think is not Canadian, who was not just a musical icon all over the world, but was a very, very proud black Canadian. We're so proud. This is a privilege. When you get one of those coins, have a very close look at it because you'll see some musical notes. Those notes uh, correspond to his 1962 composition, I think it was called Hymn to Freedom, that became an anthem for the civil rights movement in the 60s. That is the National for August the 11th. Good night.